Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sabbath and I work for Hyde as Employee Engagement and Alumni Officer. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Hyde is based in Moss House, ground floor, uh, as well as arranging, you know, events that we uh, put up, you know, put up for students. We also support students with CV guidance, uh, you know, careers guidance um, and a lot more. So without further ado, I would like to say a big thank you and a welcome uh, to Ian Preston, who has joined us today to talk about his experience in the sales and marketing area and consultancy area for the past 30 years that he's been involved in. So uh, welcome, Ian. Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me. Yep, I, I can hear you. Um, uh, students, can you can you hear Ian? Yes, and, and I've made you presenter, Ian, so you've got control of the slides. Right, OK, OK, so let's just check. Great stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. OK, yeah. that's yeah. I love yeah. the phone, though. <laughs> I thought, I thought, yeah, the only downside of doing it this way is I can't see my notes in my room to make sure I make certain points, because obviously, oh. the, never mind. Um, I, can, I can manage without. I'm sure, I've done this presentation several times before, so I'm sure we can uh, manage. OK, cool. Welcome all. Um, I'm going to get straight into things. You've got a busy day and I'd like to get to be as uh, profitable and useful as possible. Um, the way we're going to do this, I am going to present some PowerPoint slides, which will take probably about three quarters of an hour. And then uh, what I'd like you to do, if you would, is put questions in the question box. And we've allowed 10 or 15 minutes at the end uh, to have a little Q&A, which I'm assuming Sabath is going to be the question master. Is that right, Sabath? Yes, yes, Ian. Um, I'm more than happy to go through the questions. Um, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I'll just come to the slides. I won't, I won't be keeping an eye on the questions that come in. So please feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, you will have some trainers that stand in front of you uh, that will say there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, I would never dare insult my audience by suggesting you'd even think about asking stupid questions. So please feel free to ask intelligent, naive questions. Subtle difference. Right, let's crack on. Right, there we go. So, a little bit of background about me. Um, yeah, so I was in the corporate sales world for 30 years. Uh, before that, I was an apprentice, I was an engineer. Uh, went into the sales world long before, um, long before laptops and uh, mobile phones when you used to walk around industrial states knocking on doors saying, who do I need to speak to, can I have a compliment slip? And then spending half a day making all your appointments to go and see people for the following week. Uh, so that's sort of my background. Um, I set up my own business six years ago. I climbed the slippery slope in the in the in the sales world from sales rep to sales manager and subsequently sales director. So I have worked with people, training people, in particularly in sales skills for a good number of years. Set my own business up six years ago, um, initially doing sales training, uh, which we'll touch on on one of the slides later. But um, you need to be able to sell. Um, and it never ceases to amaze me how many people set up in business and don't know how to sell. Um, so that's the first takeaway. And um, so that's why um, that top line, by the way, in case you are worried, uh, actually means uh, sales and marketing, uh, not something or anything to do with a certain book about uh, Mr. Gray. Um, so just in case you were a bit concerned. Um, yes, I do a lot of work with LinkedIn. Uh, I train a lot of people on LinkedIn. I probably spend 50 percent of my time training people on LinkedIn. So I was quite interested to hear some of the things that uh, Keith was saying earlier. Um, I do a lot of keynote speaking. Uh, in fact, I probably would have been with you today had we been in a different world. Uh, and I actually did a LinkedIn presentation to BCU earlier in the year, one of the last things I did before shutdown. Um, I do some conference hosting and I do a lot of work in the education world, particularly around training school governors. So that's the sort of thing that I do. Um, so now LinkedIn training, I do a lot of LinkedIn training, coaching, sales training, and the other thing I also do, which is why I think Sebastian asked me here today, is I work with startup businesses um, and, and rel relatively new businesses to help them start up and grow. Uh, and so I coach them in the sort of things that they need to be looking out for and doing it, which is which is the subject that we're going to cover today. So. First of all, be crystal clear why you are going into business in the first place. Um, I started out in business six years ago. Um, and I knew exactly why I wanted to do it. Uh, and I thought if I don't, it was something very simple. If I don't do it now, I never will. Um, I'm probably a similar age to Keith. I'm, a, I'm over 60, although you, you, you're very welcome to say in the chat box, you certainly don't look it in. I'm all for flattery. I live on flattery. Um, but certainly the first the first takeaway needs to be 
is a big crystal clear why you are going into business because this, this will hold you actually in good stead in future years. Times will get tough. It is not plain sailing on your own business. And therefore, what you need to think about is you can all, this is a dating point almost to come back and say, yes, I know why I'm doing this and this is why I want to carry on doing it. So be crystal clear in your business. Be, be crystal clear about why you are going to business in the first place. Ah, there we go. This is absolutely vital. This is probably one of the most important things that you will ever do. Why are you going into business? Uh, sorry, where is your vision rather? Where do you want to be in three to five years' time? If you're thinking about going into business, if you've already started doing things, you need to put this thing down. You need to have this written down somewhere where you can refer to it constantly. Even put it over, over your desk or you know, on your laptop or whatever it might be. It's vitally important that you know where you want to be in three years' time. Do you want to be a market leader? Do you want to bring a brand spanking new product to the marketplace? Do you want to be the market leader or a strong second? One of the things you can't escape from is the fact that you need to think about money. Because if this is going to be your sole income, you need to think about money. And I know it's a terrible thing to talk about money, but we have to do it. If you're in business, that's why you're there. You're there to make a profit. Don't be afraid to say, I'm here, I'm here to make a profit. Yeah, that's what you're there to do. It's what makes the world go around. It's what puts the, it gives you your holidays, puts the, uh, the the clothes on your back, puts the sh shoes on your children's feet when you get there, what, what, pay your rent and all that sort of stuff. You need to be able to make money. So one of the first things you need to understand and you need to think about is how much money do I need to earn per month? And one of the things I will say to you is that you need to think about um, going six months maybe without earning anything because it's, it's hard work getting a business going. So can you have you have you got some money put aside <clears throat> that you can survive and live for six months, assuming your business doesn't make anything? But then have that number written down. How much money do I actually need to survive? How much money do I need to live live comfortably and live the life I want to live? And those are the two important numbers. Then you can work back from that. So okay, you know, is it a product or a service? Is it going to be sell? Um, so if you are selling a service, I mean, I sell a service. So effectively, I sell myself as a trainer and coach. Uh, and I know how much I charge a day. I know what my average sales value is. I know what my average quotation value is. And these are all important things that you'll need to understand when you go into business. So therefore, I know because of because of the years I've been doing this, I know how much money I want to earn. And therefore, I know what my sales conversion rate is. And therefore, I know how many quotations I need to or proposals I need to send out per month, which, are, which will normally bring me in a relevant number of orders. And you need now you won't know those to start with, and that's maybe where sometimes you need to have a one to one with your people at the uni or myself or somebody like that who can start talking to about well, what's a good conversion rate? But certainly have a vision where do I want to be in three years' time? And the reason I also say that is it helps you focus. It's very easy to drift, it's very easy to say, Well, I'll do something I'd like to do rather than something I should be doing. If you know what your vision is, you can constantly ask yourself. Is this helping me achieve my vision? Is what I am doing right now helping me achieve my vision? If you want to go and read a really good book about this, um, there's a fabulous book written by a guy called Ben Hunt Davies called Will It Make the Boat Go Faster? He was, an Olympic, or, he was an Olympic oarsman for the Great Britain team in the Sydney Olympics in 2000. And uh, they had an awful uh, Olympics in 1996. They put this new team together and they said, right, we are going to win the Olympic gold medal in, in four years' time. And they put this sign everywhere. Will it make the boat go faster? They put it in the gymnasium. They put it over the boathouse. Everywhere, this sign said, will it make the boat go faster? And every time they were looking at doing something and thinking about doing something different, they just referred to that sign. Will this make, will this make the boat go faster on that sunny Sunday afternoon in Sydney in year 2000? If the answer was no, why are we doing it? So have a concrete vision in your mind about where you want to be. Having got your vision, you therefore then need a strategy to achieve it. Um, by all means, think about what your strategy should be. But think, think about asking some questions about how you, how, how you put a strategy together. But your strategy could be as simple as something, I need to get 10 quotations a week at the door, or I need to, I need to have 10 one-to-ones of people a day, or whatever it might be. But your strategy needs to be those key five or six headline activities that you are going to do that will help you achieve your vision. 
strategies can be wrote in a number of different ways. You'll see something on there in the middle of that slide that talks about the SWOT. Now, I don't know when you've come across a SWOT before, it's about strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. And we could spend an hour just talking about how to do a SWOT analysis around your business uh, or your business model or your business plan. Have a think about all those good things that you could be doing and should be doing that will help you achieve your vision. Put in place a support network. This is absolutely vital. When you start out in business on your own, being in business on your own can be a very lonely place. And you need to think about who can help me. Who are the people around me that I can rely on? It might be family. You might be supported by family. Um, certainly friends, people like the university and, and, and the lecturers that you will work around and with, people like me if we ever work together, and all those sort of things are the sort of things that people, it's vital that you've got people around you that when times get tough that you can actually go and rely on and say, can we just have a chat? I'm, you know, I need, you need a boost or something. So have a think about the support, the support network that you need to put in place. This is again. I'm going to spend a few. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. Have you got your financials in place? You need to have a business plan right at the outset. Now, business plans can take a number of different formats, and I'm not going to cut across what they may t what, what what you may be learning at uni um, because they come in different formats. But at the end of the day, this need you need to have a business plan about what you're going to do, who you're going to speak to. It'll include a marketing plan. It'll include finances. It'll include where you're going to get your business from. It'll include things like what do you need, hardware, software, et cetera, et cetera. You need a premises. You need to buy stock, um, et cetera, et cetera, and all those sorts of things that you will need to have a business plan in place. You'll need to have a budget. I touched on this early on. You need to think about uh, how much money do I need coming into the business? How much business do I need to come into the business to firstly to survive? How much business money do, do, do I need to have in the business uh, to, to grow? And what does it look like? And it's very difficult when you start a new business as to how much business am I going to get in six months' time or 12 months' time. But at the very least you have is at least some form of plan. Um, and always remember the budget's flexible. You know, budgets aren't set in stone. Budgets are a starting point to say, well, this is what I think my 12 months look like. This is where I'm planning to spend some money. This is what my income is going to be, et cetera, et cetera. And this obviously then drifts into your cash flow forecast. And therefore, but, but bear in mind it's flexible. You know, great if you have more money coming than you anticipated. It gives you the opportunity to spend money on areas that you probably didn't anticipate or spend it quicker. If the money that's not coming in as quick as you like, then you might have to look at your budget. So actually, in, in three months into my business, I was actually going to spend some money on this and doing this. But actually, I can't because actually I need to live. And so consequently, you, um, uh, you need to have a think about that. You need to cut your cloth accordingly. You know, when you're starting out in business, unless you've got a rich benefactor giving you loads of money to start with or you've managed to save some money, um, then you are probably going to live almost on a day to day existence to start with. When I first started six years ago, um, my first website cost me 200 quid. Now, I will own up and say it wasn't the best website you've ever seen, but it got me out there. It got me a website. I was online and it's somewhere that people could see it. Now, I'm just going to pick up on something that Keith, I think, said earlier. Um, your website is a, is a shop window uh, for you and your business. But what I would say is the downside of websites is they rely on two things. They rely on firstly finding your website as opposed to somebody else's, one of your competitors. And secondly, if they find your website, they, you rely on them doing something when they get there. The great thing about LinkedIn, I fully support what Keita, the great thing about LinkedIn is, is that you can find the people that you want to do business with, your potential prospects you can Find them on LinkedIn and you can connect and engage with them on LinkedIn. So whether it's marketing, I'm a well, no, I'll we'll we'll park my talk on marketing. So because uh, we, we, we've got a subsequent slide on, on marketing. So have a think about uh, make sure your finances are in place. Don't go into business if you I can't at least live for six months without um, earning a penny. Um, but have some plans about if I earn this much over three months, I can do this and this. But if I don't earn this, I can do this, this and this. 
So have that discussion with yourselves around uh, with your budget and also your cash flow forecast. What is it going to look like? Now, if you are like me, where I am selling a service, effectively I'm selling myself, then um, it's a bit easier in so much as that I don't have a lot of outgoings. And certainly when I first started, I didn't have a lot of outgoings. Um, I, had to, I had to invest in, in buying a laptop. I had to invest in some software. And obviously I had to invest in my, um, in my website. Thereafter, effectively, there wasn't a lot of day-to-day -day spending. Um, and as time gone on, yes, I have, because I subcontract some things out. So I have some, somebody looking after my, um, my website. I have somebody looking after my emailing. I have somebody looking after my CRM system. Uh, and so I'm paying these people to take away some of the stuff that sort of cost me time, which then allows me to focus all my time on getting new clients and uh, and delivering and things like this, which is the things that I'm good at. But that only comes in time. I certainly couldn't afford to pay people to do other stuff um, uh, and at the, right at the start. Um, but as my business grew, as my business grew and the money started coming in, it enabled me to, to subcontract some of those what I call non-core activities out and allows me to focus on what I consider to be the really important stuff of, of selling and, and delivering. I tell you what, let's, we're, we're, we're about halfway through the slides, and I'm going to my head because I can't see my notes. I'm trying to do things off the top of my head. Let's stop for a couple of minutes. Have we got any questions so far on the stuff that we've uh, covered, Sabah? And let's do a little Q&A part way through. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Anybody uh, want to type in the public chat box or you can turn your microphone on and ask in questions. OK. So we've got a um, number of people typing. It takes it takes a bit of time for it to actually appear in the chat box. But please do ask questions here. We've now got 61 people in the audience here. We're growing, and that's always a positive yeah, sign. Yes, in the course of the presentation. Um, I've typed. I've typed in the name of the book. Will it just? If you look at my last type, it's will the mate boat go? No, I can't say. Can you, can it you, make you, can you, can you see me on screen? Can you see me on screen? No, you need to switch your camera on. Oh, well, yeah, we can't. Yeah, we can't see you, Ian. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't um, even realize it wasn't on. Oh, there you go. I left my camera. Sorry, I, I didn't realize. Right. You can't get on to my arm. We and thought then. maybe you, you know, you were probably interested. You know, probably didn't want to share your camera, but that's perfectly well, fine. You're more than happy to put it on. <laughs> let me get the book to show you. Where's it gone? Even it is. That's the book. Good morning. If possible, I'd like to ask Ian a question. Please do. Hi, Ian. It might be something that you're going to cover next based on your current slide, but I wanted to know what sort of qualifications you actually need in order to set up as a consultant. That is a great question. Um, and it's about credibility more than qualifications. Okay. So when, when you first start out, and you guys are obviously a lot younger than I am, so when you first start out, qualifications are really, really important because employers will expect you to be qualified to a certain level and have certain qualifications if you're going into a particular industry. Um, the longer that you go on, you become what I call QBE. Has anybody come across the phrase QBE before? No. Nope. Cool. It means qualified by experience. Oh, OK. Now, yes, I have some coaching qualifications. Um, I did uh, I did a business degree when I was in my 50s. I was a mature student. I am probably the only person that you know right now that in his wallet I have a senior rail card because unfortunately I qualify, but I also have a student union card from my time at Kingston University. Um, and the reason I kept my student union card is for some reason when I went there about 10, 12 years ago, uh, they got my birthday wrong by 15 years. So oh, wow. according to my student union card, I'm 15 years younger. So if somebody says, Ian, you're not, you don't look old enough to be traveling on the train on the senior rail card, I can show them my card. This says I'm 63. And if somebody said, Ian, you're never 47, I say, here's my student union card with my date of birth. I'm <laughs> um, so, yes, when you yes, when you are first starting out, you definitely need some qualifications around because obviously that's what employers will uh, will, will expect. But certainly uh, after a period of time, then what they're more interested in is your reputation. Okay. Keith, mentioned, Keith mentioned early on 
he mentioned um, about uh, recommend. He, he touched on. He didn't have a chance to go into it in any in, in any great detail, but he touched on um, recommendations on your LinkedIn profile, and these are extreme. And these are extremely important. Why? Because uh, if you, I've got something like 160 recommendations on LinkedIn for the work that I do around coaching people, around sales skills, and around um, LinkedIn and stuff, and, and coaching people in new businesses. Um, if you were looking for a LinkedIn trainer, for example, to pick on the point that Keith is making, if you're looking for a LinkedIn trainer and two people said, I'm good, and one person over here said, I'm good, but they've got no recommendations, and I'm standing mm -hmm. over here saying, I'm good, and I've got 160 recommendations, then who are you going to ring first? You, because you've got the highest recommendation. There you go. So, yes, it's, it's a great question. Um, for some reason, I can't see the chat box. I'm probably I'm looking in the wrong place. I'll probably check. Here we go. I'll pull this up now, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, I, I hope that uh, – was that uh, – Hala, Hala, I hope you pronounced your name right. Uh, was that no, no, it's Sharon. Sharon. Apologies, Sharon. That's so, there's the answer simply. When you first start, yes, you need qualifications. Absolutely, because it'll get your first rung on the ladder. After you gain some skills and some experience – People are more interested in the skills and experience that you've got and what other people think about you than actually the qualifications that you've got maybe 10, 20 years ago. OK, just to clarify, you don't need specific qualifications in consultancy. You just need to be qualified in whatever yeah. discipline you're working consultancy, in. Yeah. Consultancy covers a multitude. Of, you can be a consultancy in logistics. You can be a consultant in finance, in data. In, in my particular case, it's around sales skills and business improvement and, and individual performance. Um, you don't actually need a, a particular qualification for anything, no. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. It's about your reputation. OK, that's brilliant. Um, any other questions today before we carry on? Just a thought. Um, Not from me. <laughs> Hannah's asked, asked some questions um, in in the chat box. She said, as a consultant, how do you convince smaller businesses to pay you for your services? Oh. Uh, finances. That's a good one, Hannah. <laughs> That's a great question. Persuading people to part with their cash is is difficult. Uh, is, a, is one of the biggest challenges. It's actually where I'm going to come on to talking about selling shortly. But it is about selling skills. That's the thing that we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk shortly about the difference in, between uh, sales and marketing. We have got those. I'm gonna, uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time, a little bit more time on that because they are really two of the most important things. Um, but it does come down to the to, to your selling skills. So can we just park that one for a few, a few minutes, Hala? And uh, I'll touch on that when I come on to the slide about sales and marketing. Um, I can see another one now. What, what if we haven't got the relevant skills and qualifications? What's the best way to develop them? Um, experience. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's literally, I mean, when I first started out, I had an empty diary and no money coming in. And I offered to do work for free for people to gain, to gain experience. That did two things. It gave me experience in how to coach and, and learn some new skills. It also showed other people that I could do it. And therefore, they recommended me then to other people who then subsequently paid me. And work experience and placements, absolutely, Rachel. Yes. So again, anything that will get anything that will give you um, that you can do that will a, enhance your skill base, but also will spread the word around to a number of different people that you are pretty good at doing what you do. And also, I mean, I, I get a lot of work in the normal world. I get a lot of work from my speaking engagements. So on the subjects that I'm talking about today, sales and marketing and time management and all that sort of stuff, I do regular speaking engagements. Some I get paid for, some I don't. And I'm not really for, obviously, I prefer to be paid, wouldn't we all? Um, but certainly do them for free. Why? Because if I speak at an expo or speak at somewhere, generally speaking, I pick business up as a result of doing that. So I did a LinkedIn presentation, for example, just a couple of weeks before lockdown one, as we call it now, lockdown in March, and not far from you guys at VCU. Um, there were about 50, 60 people in the audience, and I think I picked up at least three or four bits of paid work as a result of doing that free presentation. So one of the things you have to do, it'll come under the mark. When we start talking about marketing, it will come under the marketing banner. Of you, need to, you need to get yourself out there and spread the word around what you do. 
uh, and that way then that will give you the experience of your living but it'll also get your word out what's Matteo put here answer to question above you can start with advising people in normal life or try to learn more knowledge in certain areas and, and give advice when people recognize you absolutely yep yep if you're good but if you love it and be enthusiastic yeah be yeah absolutely be enthusiastic um, so yeah, have you got all? So let, let's move on to this next slide then. Um, um, oh, by the way, there was one thing I wanted to mention because uh, I've just looked at my notes, which I wanted something I wanted to mention a couple of slides ago. Um, and this was put in place to support Nick. Yes, it is your family, um, uh, but if and yes, it will be the people in the business community at the university, etc. But also bear in mind that if you can, at some stage, get some absolutely some coaching. What I'm doing here is effectively a, a, a mild form of coaching. It's just giving you a flavour and it's only scratching the surface of some of the things that you need to be thinking about when you set up your business. I could talk for an hour virtually on each of these slides uh, and, and, and give you some details. So, again, uh, if you can get a coach or a mentor to help you in the early days, uh, that would be very, very useful. Um, one of the things I say to people, if people say, oh, I can't afford it. Sometimes you can't not afford it. Um, if, the, if the uni again are supplying this sort of service for free, then grab it with both hands. Uh, if not, then think about can I employ a mentor or a coach that will give me some help? You will you will succeed. And I say this to everybody, whether they are paying me to be coach, to coach them or not. I will say to anybody, you will succeed on your own. If you've got the passion, the enthusiasm and the skills and the drive and the desire, you will succeed and grow your business on your own. What you will do with a coach or a mentor is grow it faster and bigger and quicker. So don't think of having a coach or a mentor as being a cost, but think about it being an investment. And that's a really important takeaway, I think. You see, you know, part of your... I mean, think about it. You, you guys, I'm sure, haven't got children right now, but those of us who are more mature have, and when you think, you know... You're, when you grow up and you start having 10, 11, 12-year-old kids, you're, if you've got a daughter, she may go dancing or playing football or playing hockey or gymnastics or whatever. All those sorts of games, all those sorts of games and activities, they've all got a coach. They've all got a trainer. They've all got people working with them to, to help them get better, learn new skills and improve. It never ceases to amaze me how many people in business think they don't need it. They'll happily have their children being coached and trained but they don't think they need it for their business. And, and I have to say, it's very much a UK thing. In America, virtually every business has got, um, uh, has got uh, a, a coach or a, a mentor of some description. And yet in the UK, trying to persuade some business people to have a, business, have a coach or a mentor is, is difficult and is challenging. I don't know if you guys have come across a guy called Eric Schultz. Eric Schultz used to be uh, the CEO of Google. He's now the president and chairman of the, of the holding company. But I've got a fabulous video. And if you go on my LinkedIn uh, side, just go on my LinkedIn. So just, just search Ian Preston on LinkedIn and you'll find me. It's got stars everywhere, which, which is why it stands out. Um, and there is a video on there by a guy called Eric Schultz. Or you can always get it on YouTube. Uh, and he was the CEO of Google. And somebody said, you need a coach. And he said, why? I'm the CEO of Google. I'm an experienced business person. And I said, you need a coach. Coaches do two things. Um, they challenge your thinking. Uh, they don't tell you how to run your business, but they challenge your thinking. So they give you some options to think about things in different ways. But more importantly, they hold you to account. If I say to you, go away and connect with 50 people this week on LinkedIn and 50 people next week on LinkedIn, or go away and send out uh, 10 proposals to new clients in the next two weeks, if you've got nobody holding you to account, then you'll probably think, why should I do it? If you're having a regular meeting with a coach, say every couple of weeks or once a month, and that the coach sets you that challenge, then bet you by golly gum, you'll have done it the following month because why would you pay a coach to help you and then not do it? And one of the things I also say to people in business, if they, can't, if they think they can't afford a coach and they've got children, tell your kids. Tell your kids they'll hold you to, to tell your kids they'll hold you a chance. Tell your kids that their summer holiday depends on you bringing in 20 grand worth of orders a week. Have a guess what will happen every Friday. Your kids will say to you, Mom, Dad, how many orders this week? Get your backside out there and work a bit harder next week. I want a holiday this year. That's been held to account. And that's what we mean by having a support network. 
this is really weird because I can't see the audience and I can't hear anything. I can't get any feedback. So I'm not sure whether she's going down well or not, but I hope it is. Um, do you have the relevant skills? Um, you may be good at what you do, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, whatever it is you're going to do. Um, but there are so many more skills to running a business. Um, so sit down, write early doors and think, what skills do I need? Yes, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to earn my money doing. But do I have I got some financial knowledge? Do I understand my financials and my cash flow and, and, and my budgeting? Um, do, have I got the relevant sales skills and marketing skills which are come on to uh, and all those sorts of things? Um, be honest with yourself. Be brutally honest with yourself because you need all those skills. You, would, you need those skills to run a successful business. And if you haven't got them, you'll either suffer, your business won't take off or make even fail. 50% of businesses fail within the first 12 months, apparently. So, again, you need to get out there and make it, do everything you possibly can and put everything in place to make sure that your business succeeds. So think about sales, marketing, finance, whatever other skills you need. Think about what can you learn. If you haven't got them, can I learn them? Uh, I'm a bit kind of – I don't know whether it comes as part of your training with the, uh, with the uni or not. Uh, but where can I get them from or do I need to buy them in? And if, and if you need to buy them in, then you will obviously need to budget for that as well. Oh, another one of my favourite subjects, time management or time mastery, as I call it. Um, you need to allocate time per week to do all the tasks in running a business. That's all the things that we we're talking about before. So it's not just about doing the work that you are paid to do that earns you the money. Um, I like it. The, the analogy I always say is it's a bit like um, pillars holding a building up. You'll have one pillar called sales, one called marketing, one called finance, maybe one called HR, one called delivery, da da da, da and all the relevant skills that you need. Um, if you ignore one of those, it doesn't matter how strong all the other one, all the other pillars are. If you allow one pillar to crumble, the building will come down anyway. However good you are, all the other ones. So you need to allocate time per week. And again, when I work with people, I coach people, I give them what's called a default diary, which effectively allows them to plan into their week some time for sales calls, some time for marketing calls, some time to do some project work, some time to do delivery, some time to do those bigger elephant tasks. Um, that that you might come across. And what do I mean by elephant tasks? Here's the thing. Um, I'm sure if I if you're in front of me, I said who uses to do lists, and I'm sure a number of people in the audience would put their um would put their hand up and just say I do. To do lists are okay to a point, but they can be dangerous. So let's say for example, Monday you get up and you write ten things on to do list. I'm going to do on Monday, and you do eight of them. So you cross eight of them off, and you think at the end of Monday that's fabulous. Ah. Oh. I've had a really good day. There's only two things I haven't done. I'll carry those over to Tuesday. And then you have some more things on. At the end of Tuesday, you've got rid of eight items and you've got two items left. And the same thing happens on Wednesday. Have a guess which two items are, generally speaking, left over on the list each day that you keep carrying over. Either something you don't want to do or something that is going to be such a big task, eight, ten hours work, maybe, that you think, I haven't got eight or ten hours work. I haven't, so I'll just leave it for the time being. But if it's on your list and it's important to do, and again, I get into talk. To, I talk to people about what's called Eisenhower's matrix, which looks at the difference between something that's important and something that's urgent and put it into order. Um, so if you have got something you've decided it's important to do and it's going to be 10 hours work, then you need to allocate that time and build that time into your schedule by the by the deadline date. So look when it needs to be done. Right, well, I, can, I can do two hours here. I can do four hours there. I can do three hours there. I can do two hours there. And in a week and a half, It'll actually be done. And that's what I mean by planning and building stuff into your schedule. And again, when I work with people on a one to one basis, I give them some tools that enables them to do that around um, what I call carrying over your to do and priorities uh, off your to do list, but also building into it into your into your time and into your default diary. So you need to allocate time to do all those things. And sometimes, again, this is where a coach comes in. Sometimes, again, it's uh, it's you're, you're, you're spending time or you've got a problem what you think you've got, but actually you haven't, which is where a, a coach comes in. I had a lady here. I had a lady heard me speak two or three years ago. I do some coaching with her every year. But the first time we got together, she said, hey, I've been speaking on time mastery. 
He said, Ian, I am shocking and time mastery. I'm awful. I'm having to spend seven days a week and to do stuff. So I went and we, we, we started having an hour, an hour time together each week. And one of the very first call I sat down with her, it was patently obvious that she was very, very good at time management. She was allowing the time in a week to do all the important things like the calls, like the doing and all and the finance and all that sort of stuff. What she wasn't doing was charging enough. She was a bookkeeper. I knew then the bookkeeping rate was around £20 an hour and she was only charging 15 Plus the fact that we've got somebody giving some work that was skimming some off the top and therefore she was scared to lose that. So I had to coach her in how to ask for more money. The time management was immense, but she would not have found that out. And she'd have carried on spending seven days a week um, if she hadn't sat down with me and started having that discussion. What happened? In I think about six weeks after we had our first call, she was getting £20 an hour. She'd kick the person that was given a business at a low value into touch. She'd fill the diary up and she was only working five days a week. She was working four days earning money and one day doing all the other stuff that she needs to support her business. And she was happy as Larry. And then we worked on her a bit more. And then she said, I need to go on holiday. I've been on holiday for ages. And so we put some things in place. And then she said, uh, and, I, and, I, and I said, and she, she filled the diary with £20 a week work or £20 an hour work rather. And, and I then said to her, I said, what are you going to do now when somebody comes on and they said, um, can you do some work for me? And she said, you're going to ask me for £25 an hour, aren't you? I said, I am. But she was uncomfortable with that. She didn't think she was worth £25 an hour. And I said to her, I said, if you don't think you're worth £25 an hour, your client certainly won't. So, again, we had to do some work and give her some confidence. And I gave her some tools and techniques around to ask for even more money. So, again, those are the sort of things that you can learn if you work with people who know what they're doing. Ah, where have we gone to? Right, let's do the next one. Where have we got here? Right. Yeah, again, invest in your own self-development. Um, I pulled that book I showed you just off the shelf. It's one of about or 20 or 30. I, I'm a constant reader. I'm constantly looking to improve. Even now, one of the best books I ever read back in the 80s when I first started uh, was In Search of Excellence, written by a couple of If you guys have been doing business studies, Tom Peters is a real, is a real go-to guy. Um, I, I flicked through. I flicked through that book recently, and uh, it's still it's still valid today. So, but I've got books on my shelf. I'm just looking now. I've got Alex Ferguson, uh, leading really good. Uh, David Coulthard, who was a Formula One driver, he's he's heavy into business. He's written a great book as well. But there's loads of other books. Um, two other books I, I, I draw your attention to. Um, you need to involve yourself in negotiating. I haven't put anything up today about negotiating, but you certainly need to learn how to negotiate. It's part of sales skills. And I thought I was good at negotiating. And then I came across a book called Never Split the Difference by a guy called Chris Voss. And he was lead, he was lead negotiator for the FBI. If any American anywhere in the world was taken hostage, they sent for him. And when you are negotiating for people's lives, it just takes it to a whole new level. And some of the tools and techniques I read and learned from him was absolutely marvelous. Brilliant. And the other one I'd refer you to is Giuliani on leadership. Rudy Giuliani was the mayor of New York when um, when uh, the Twin Towers came down. And uh, just reading about how he arrived at where he got to be mayor was interesting. How he dealt with the aftermath and the, the things he put in place and how he managed it all is, was an amazing read. So, again, I, um, I encourage you to read that. But overall, I encourage you to um, assign time and money to develop yourself. It will be, above anything else, the best investment you will ever make. Right. I'm now going to come on to two. I think uh, two are the two of the most important things I think that you will uh, that, you, that you will come across. Again, we haven't got a lot of time here. So what I want to say here is there's a difference between marketing and selling. My different my definition of marketing is anything and everything that you do that gets to one to one conversation. I'll say that again. Anything and everything that you do that gets to one to one conversation. Now, when I run marketing and LinkedIn workshops, we spend time talking about all the different types of marketing, email blasts, speaking at events, your website, uh, going, um, going to expos, having expo stands and networking uh, and all those sorts of things. And, and personal referrals as well, obviously, which is probably the best one you'll ever He's the best one you ever have. So you need to think about a marketing plan. You need to think how and where you're going to do it. Where you're going to go, who you're going to speak to, how many marketing calls you're going to make a week, what events you're going to go to, all that sort of stuff. You need a marketing plan. 
But bear in mind, the definition of marketing is anything and everything that you do that gets to a one-to-one conversation. Once you get to that one-to-one conversation where it's face-to-face, over a beer, over a coffee, when we can, um, your marketing is finished and you're now into business development and selling, which are totally different skill sets. And if you're starting out, start recording which bit of your marketing works and which bit doesn't, because 90% of marketing doesn't work. And what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the people next to you, person next to you. So start having to think, record what marketing you do, how many networking events you go to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and record where your proposals come from and where your orders come from. If I was to say to you, for example, that 90% of the proposals that I send out the door came from this particular chunk of marketing that I do, you'd say, that tick in the box, that's obviously working. But then if I was to say to you that actually I, hard, I hardly got any orders from those proposals, but this bit of marketing over here I did only led to 10% of the proposals I send out, but actually virtually everyone comes in as an order, no way you can start thinking about spending the time. So, again, that's what we mean by KPIs and start recording and measuring. So test and measure, test and measure, test and measure and use it to develop and change. So you need to have a marketing plan. You need to think, uh, where am I going to do? And how, many, how, many, how many calls do I need to make uh, to get to the number of one-to-one conversations? And that, again, is important because then you can allocate time. You know, I'm going to have to make, I'm going to have to send out, and I, when I work with people on LinkedIn, I show, I give them a semi-automated system on how to connect with 50 people a week on LinkedIn by spending no more than 10 minutes a day. And let's say, for example, you send 50 LinkedIn connection requests a week out and only half of those connect, that's 25, and only half of those people respond to your follow-up message, that's 12, and only half of those people say, yes, Ian, I'm happy to have a one-to-one conversation. I've now got six one-to-one conversations next week that I didn't have this week and the week after, and the week after, and the week after that. So you need to keep doing it. So understand marketing and understand what works for you and what not and where your potential clients hang out. As I say, I could spend three hours talking about marketing. I could spend even longer talking about sales. Sales is, is, a, is something I'm absolutely passionate about. You have to be able to sell in, LinkedIn, in, in, in business. If business will not come flying over the wall and land in your lap, it doesn't matter how good you are, how nice a person you are, how cheap you are, you need to be able to sell. You need to ask the right question. I wrote a blog. Go and go look at my LinkedIn profile. I wrote a blog early on this year called Objection Handling Isn't the Silver Bullet. Because lots of people say, Ian, if only I could handle objections better, I'd be so much better than I'd set. I'd get more orders coming in. Yes, you will. But my experience is that most, most orders are lost far earlier in the sales process. Yes, you will be able to sell more if you can handle objections better. You know, how, you know, somebody said it's too expensive. Somebody said too expensive. The answer is never. I'll do it cheaper. And again, I talk people through and I coach and train people in sales skills about how to deal with that and stuff. But as I say, I put I, I show people a seven stage sales process and invariably sales are lost. Not sales are lost. Not because um, um, sales are lost. Not because you can't objection handle but actually because you didn't ask the right questions and didn't structure your proposal in the right place early on, or you didn't even speak to the right person. So I'm going to think about it. When I say, I'm, 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 I'm going to just spend on this. No orders means no money. If you can't bring business in, you ain't going to have any money. So it's probably the most important thing you'll ever have to learn. Because as I said early on, it's money that helps you grow your business. It puts the shoes on your kids' feet. It puts the clothes on your back. It pays for your car. It pays for your holidays. It pays for your social life. It pays for somewhere to live. Um, you need to be able to sell because that's what brings that which brings the money in. And I think we're coming close to. Oh yes, there we go. Um, I said it was ten top tips for new businesses, but there's eleven slide. Always over deliver and where your market. Always get people talking about you saying, you know what? He always goes the extra mile. He, he or she is worth talking to because they always over deliver. They say they're going to do this thing, but you always get great value. That's what you want people talking about. Um, I was having a discussion recently with somebody about the definition of branding. And there's one famous businessman whose name just slips from mind for the time being, who says branding is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So I want people saying to me, Ian also gives great value. He's worth talking to. He's very knowledgeable. He's a nice chap. But more importantly, he goes the extra mile to make sure that you are sati- you are a satisfied client.
What's your biggest takeaway from the session? Tell me, please, in the in the chat box. And also, we'll also move on to um, – have you got any questions at all at the same time? So uh, that's what I'm going to hand over to. Um, so, yeah, I'd be interested if you could put in the chat box what your biggest takeaway has been from this morning session. And at the same time, if you haven't already, please put questions in the box and we'll have a little q and I did say 45 minutes, didn't I? How about that for time management? Excellent. Excellent. Could, would you be able to just go back through – that first book and some of the books you were recommending. What was the first book you said? Um, well, I, need, I need to get myself up on screen now because let me let me. Oh, I'll switch the camera off again. Have a nice camera. Screen. You can show oh, us. Yeah, yeah. I, was gonna say, I couldn't understand why I couldn't see myself. Uh, <laughs> oh no, I don't. I don't, I don't want to share what I'm doing, do I? No. Oh, there we go. Right. So you can. Can you see me now? Just about. You're coming through. Yes, we can see you. We can see you getting your book. Let me books. OK, so these are some of the these are some of the real books that I think are really well worth uh, reading. Um, yes, you've got to do the form. Yes, you've got to do the formal training stuff. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Should we take, should we take the slides down now? I'm going to leave that um, slide up. I'm just saying I can see. Can I, can I see? I obviously can't see the audience. Can I? Right. OK, never mind. Um, some of the books are referred to. Um, this is a good one. Alex Ferguson, ex-Man United manager. It's about not, not his autobiography, but he talks about how he leads. He's now actually a lecturer at Harvard Business School. There you go. So that's a good read. That's a good read. This was the one I mentioned before, written by Ben Hunt Davis. Will it make the boat go faster? That's a good read. That that ties in um, a, a, an autobiography about an Olympic athlete, but also it's co-written with somebody called Harriet Beveridge, who, who then adds to effectively – the theory behind what they were, the business theory behind what they were doing. And that's a really good read. A um, couple more. Giuliani, ex-mayor ex of um, New York. That's a real good read about how he, how, how he grew his business, how he arrived where he was, but more importantly, how he dealt with the aftermath of 9-11. Um, David Coulthard, you might not be into motor racing driving, but again, that links uh, that links uh, his career. But he talks about leadership strategy, motivation, risk management, how to build ta uh, team building and that sort of stuff. He also talks about a favourite subject of mine, I've just noticed on the back, marginal gains. Uh, I'm heavily into my sport and Dave Brailsford, who and I'm heavily into cycling, and Dave Brailsford, who's led British cycling for many, many years, um, he used to refer to it as, as the aggregate of marginal gains. It's not one huge thing that will make a huge difference to your business. It's lots of little things that add on top of each other that make the big difference. You know, so the aggregate of marginal gain. And this other one, if you get into negotiating, uh, I shouldn't really give you this one because I use a lot of stuff in here now when I do my negotiating skills course. So if you read this, you won't need me, but hey-ho. <laughs> um, never split the difference. Now, the only thing I would say about this is there is some heavy-duty stuff in there and it is not for beginners. So uh, there's lots of simple stuff you need to learn about negotiating. Uh, so with a great respect, a lot of this will go over your head. And I don't say that lightly, um, but there is some quite detailed stuff in there. But it's a, it's a, as I say, I've been doing negotiating skills for many, many years as an intro part to selling. But certainly the, 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 some, of the, some of the psychology they use and the language in they use and their voice control and things like timing, just take, just took my my negotiating skill levels to a whole different board to a whole different level. So again, that's a good read. I just I've got loads more up there, but those are those are the three or four probably I think are, are probably my favourites. Okay. Oh, any recommendation for something for beginners? Uh, Felicia's asking. What reading? Or what what what, what advice for beginners? Sorry. Uh, any recommendations for something for beginners? I think I think she's asking for reading because I've said they can put these on their Christmas lists. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Who asked that question? Oh, yeah, Felicia. Felicia, Felicia I apologise. I've been I can't I can't remember. <laughs> I'm too I'm too long in the tut to remember what it was like to be a beginner. I do apologise. Um, I would. I don't know whether it's Shannon. I don't know whether it's Rachel. Rather, I don't know whether you guys are doing stuff that you give them as part of their as part of their their learning cycle uh, at, at uni. Um, but I'm happy to have one to ones afterwards if anybody wants to. Uh, we. I, th I think Rachel, you and I need to have a conversation. So Beth needs to have a conversation about about what happens next on this because what I don't want to do is start having everybody come to me and taking them away from you. So I think we probably need to have that formalised that conversation. Although. Yeah. 
Um, somebody says here uh, that I need to I need you to be a B scene mentor. Thank you, Joe. That's very kind. Yes, I please. Know, I don't know. What a B, I don't know what a B scene mentor is, but let's talk about it. All right. Yeah, because if if you could come in with the BC project, that would be great because um, students can access you. Just depends how much time you've got. Um, but the BC project is a project we've been running for years with other universities across um, Birmingham. But it's particularly for mentoring students that want to be entrepreneurs. Okay. And let's take that conversation offline, Rachel. I'll, you know. I'll, I'll... Yeah. 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 I was gonna say something, but no, yeah, let's take that conversation offline. Okay. All right. Can you forward the blog? Maybe it could be Batio. Could you forward the blog? I'm not sure what the blogging means to be fair. Um I'm not sure. Can you forward the blog? Maybe it could be Oh yeah, Ian. Uh sorry interrupt. The blog was the one that you mentioned you put up earlier this year. Oh, your... yeah, it's on my LinkedIn profile. Yeah, uh, basically speaking, yeah, it's go on my LinkedIn profile. I, I saw the link to it early on. So go on my LinkedIn profile, look for articles, uh, or even go to my website, which is www.ijpconsultancy.co.uk. Um, but I'd rather you go to the web, um, uh, my, my, I'd rather you go to my LinkedIn profile um, for the reason I said early on. Uh, I don't know who's looked at my um, uh, profile. Uh, who's looked at my web page, but I certainly know uh, who has uh, looked at my um, uh, LinkedIn profile. And I would encourage you all to to join my connect with my LinkedIn. Please, uh, but please just don't connect. Just don't press connect. Just put a nice little pre just put a nice little introductory message. Just say hi, Ian. Hopefully, loved your presentation this morning at uh, uh, on, on 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 business startups. Um, would love to connect. That serves two purposes. A, it's always a nice thing to do if you send somebody a nice, a nice, friendly um, connection message as opposed to just pressing connect. Secondly, it serves you in good stead maybe two or three years down the line is if you don't speak to somebody for a couple of years and then they suddenly contact you, you can look back in your messages and see how you first met. So if, if, if your message says it was great, it, it was great to um, uh, at, uh, 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 it was great to see, hear your presentation at the UCB thing then uh, I know exactly where we first met. So please, by all means, please go and connect my LinkedIn. Also, I have something like 7,500 first-tier connections. So mm. as soon as you connect with me, next time you go searching for a good contact, you'll immediately get access to my 7,500 high-quality con uh, contacts on LinkedIn. So again, um, yes, <laughs> well, okay, I've just seen a message. It says I need premium. Uh, it needs premium to message you. It means... Does it, uh, I can't. I, I apologise. I forget his name wrong. Is it Ethimos? Apologies. I had a good go. Um, cool. Um, right. I assume that you're on LinkedIn right now. And it's, I assume it says I am a third tier connection. Does it? If the answer to that question is yes, right. Go to the side where it's instead of message. Go to the side, and there will be a drop down box that says more. I'm doing this from memory now because I can't see my LinkedIn profile. Click click on more and it's dropped one of the ones that says connect. If you click on connect, you should then be able to send me a message. And that's a backdoor way to get to third tier connections. There's a freebie for you. Does that work? I'm looking for a yes. Yeah, Patricia says yes. There you go, see? And I'm not even doing the LinkedIn presentation. So yeah, that, 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 that's your back door way. That, I'll just say, if you thought you were going to pay for premium on LinkedIn, which costs you 50 or 60 pound a month, then um, then I'll probably just save you 50, 60 pound a month straight away. What great value are you getting here this morning? Yeah, <laughs> good value for money. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, okay, somebody's saying where where is the more button? Right, can I share my screen? How do I go about sharing my screen? Right. Um, on the bottom, far right, there's actually a computer screen with a line through it. There's actually a square screen and it's got a line through it. If you click on that, nice so bottom, yeah. bottom right. No, I tell you what, um, there, there should be a more. If you go, okay, the easiest thing to do is if you go to the top of your profile, go to the top of my profile, it's got my picture and it probably says connect. And then to the right of that, there should be a button that says, I think it says more normally. Let me just look on my, I'm just looking on my profile now because at the moment I need to find somebody that I'm not directly connected to. 
Yeah, it says connect, message or more. And if you click on more, there's a drop down box that actually should say connect on there. If not, let's uh, drop me an email and let's have a conversation offline. My email address for anybody that wants it is ian at ijpconsultancy.co.uk. And we'll set up a quick one to one. But th that's normally where doing it. LinkedIn normally LinkedIn normally says that you cannot connect with um, with uh, third tier connections without paying. Uh, but in this particular case, that, 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 that that's the way you can. No second, I've lost everybody. There we go. Um, any more? It's three dots. Yes, to the previous answer. Good. What do we click after more? Drop down. Yeah, click on more. Drop down. There should be a button that says connect. But I'm saying, uh, don't, don't get, let's get too hung up on that because suddenly we've gone into LinkedIn mode. Has anybody got any questions around some of the stuff that we've talked about um, this morning? I'm conscious of time. We've got about three minutes left, I think. Is there anything I didn't cover? Gath, I'll need to leave the conference notes on the one. Thank you for your time. A brilliant presentation. Oh, thank you. Flash will get you everywhere, so thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody. We had about 63, 64 people in the conference. So um, very, very successful, very helpful. 